Our next discussion here is entitled Values, Behaviours and Culture. We're going to have a panel discussion on that. It's the team of the weekend and it's the team of the year as well. Okay, so I want to introduce you to our panel. Our first guest led Waterford to five hurling finals in his time, including an All-Ireland final, and he won the county's third ever Division I title in 2015. When he came on board as Waterford manager, Derek McGrath made people think. He changed outlooks, he changed attitudes. He's an excellent manager, an excellent person, school teacher, and a father. So ladies and gentlemen, our first guest up on stage, could you give a warm welcome to Derek McGrath from Waterford. So uh, Chris van der Hagen mentioned Belgium and the small size of the country and how they've achieved so much. Uh, on a GEA scale, um, Carlo footballers have made huge strides over the last few years uh, through the coaching of, of Stephen Poacher and maybe the management of Thurlow O'Brien. Two very different styles, but they came together. Uh, one of the, I suppose, the finest exponents of that is Paul Broderick. Paul, for the first time since Colum Hayden in 1994, Paul Broderick secured a football all-star nomination. Uh, by the time he had actually come to prominence, he had won 19 clocked up in the 2018 uh, Leinster semi-final stage. That's how good he was. So Paul is able to talk about life as a, uh, a GEA player, how he had to wait maybe a couple of years' patience to hit right form. He's also teaching in Haywood Community School in Leash, and he teaches business and accounting there. So he gives us an overall perspective. So Paul Broderick from Carlo, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our next panellist then arrived on the inter-county scene at 17. He first linked up with the interim minors. He li later lined out that year with the 21s, made his senior debut in 2007, and has been a key member of the team since then. Five Ulster medals and a Walsh Cup medal as well. He's represented Ulster on a number of occasions and a two-time Ulster medalist with his club as well. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Neil McManus from Antrim. And our final speaker then, it's just important to bring a bit of balance and perspective in it. Uh, Dr. Kevin Moran is from Donegal. He's seen so much in the GEA down through the years. He's chair of the GEA's uh, Scientific um, Medical and Player Welfare Committee. Donegal team doctor. He's managed, uh, he's been doctor for the Irish International Rules Squad as well. So our final panelist then is Dr. Kevin Moran from Donegal. And I'll go on the, the remote headset and I'll sit down beside you for a chat, lads. Um, Derek, just want to come to you first of all, just picking up on Chris there. I mean, it's not too often you get to hear a world-class speaker like him. What did you make of him and did anything stick out with you first of all on his presentation? Yeah, hugely impressive anyway. Um, just, I suppose, like everyone sitting down here, you're just trying to learn uh, when you're up here. Learned a huge amount, um, I suppose what you do when you're sitting down there, you kind of try and bring it to your own sport straight away, you bring it to the club, um, De La Salle, and bring it to your scenario at Waterford. You know, it was interesting to see that, it, I see one of the headlines that said, five or six years it took to get other people over the line on it, you know, other people to collaborate on the whole ideas, and I think that's, the scenarios in GA circles can be difficult in terms of getting every pe person on board with the overall vision, because at times we sent, we, even though, I don't think it's egotistical, but I think we, we have a habit of looking after our own patch, you know, with the view to making progress, equating progress to winning. So, but I think we're getting better at developing a mindset where we're, you know, focusing on the process and then, you know, but it's, that's, that's more difficult in a scenario where, you know, you want Lee McCarthy in your hands or you want, you know, so I think there's, it was interesting to see the fact that he talked about the importance of collaboration. So. I would say that's important, that the people that are strategizing, that are making those strategies with you and above you are completely in sync with where you want to go, otherwise it's a, it's a, it's, it's the process is going to fail ultimately, you know? Derek, he got 10 years, they got 10 years to get the vision through. If you were appointed a manager of a team at adult level in GEA, five or six defeats, people can be whispering behind your back. There could be a culture out there to maybe make sure you're not even there the next year. How can we improve at that top level? As an association, everything that's happening underage looks to be going in the right direction. Fun, enjoyment, games, exposure, development, progression. How do we get that message to seep up to the, the higher tiers? Well, I, I think we're getting it. I think days like today, without bigging up today or the last number of years where we're actually seem to be more open to 
change open to the fact that looking at other models from other sport, whether it's New, the New Zealand rugby model, whether it's the Belgian FA, I was at another event that was held here a number of weeks ago at Balance where we had speakers from the English FA that talked about how Garrett Southgate's culture in terms of, so I think we're getting better at it. So I think the process has already started. And I think the more people bring their ideas, you know, to the fertile environment of a club from a conference like this and say this, not, not in a kind of all encompassing, empowering way and say this is the way it has to be done, but you know, good people, I suppose, I know, and connection and relationships, the very basic principles that, that that chap spoke about, you know, and I think that's the, so I think we're in the process of doing it. I think it's, we're getting way better. We're less skeptical. We're less um, cynical in terms of our attitude towards coaching and treating people as, as or treating athletes as players and human beings, first of all. I think we're, I think there's a general uh, moving forward in terms of the awareness around that anyway. So I think, I think we're on the right road. Paul, you're um, uh, another member of our Sky Sports Ambassadors here today. Uh, Chris's presentation will be up on the GEA Learning Portal website, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. But what did you take out of it as a, as a current inter-county player? Did you take much out of it? Um, probably the, the greatest, I was just chatting to Neil um, when we were sitting down there in front, and the, the thing that hits you most when you finish listening is that how simple it all seems. Um, and you kind of nearly feel stupid that you didn't come up with this yourself, you know, or that, that, that it's not happening all around you. And um, we were just saying, like, you know, uh, coaching young teams, any teams, you, young teams you've coached, like, you put a goal in front of them. The first thing we do, even as senior players now, we go out, maybe we shouldn't do, but you go out and you kick balls over the bar. That's what you want to do. You want to score. Even cornerbacks, everybody wants to score. And um, I suppose that's what you take from it. Give them what they love. Like, one of the major things in any bits of coaching I've done with school or in my club, um, if I'm ever to get stressed about it, it's because I feel that maybe there's a little bit too much to do. Like, you're trying to organize maybe a bus, you're trying to organize a referee, all these different things. Like, an awful lot of what Chris said, you just let happen. Um, you know, you set it up and, like, you don't have to be down the other end of the field, 100 meters away. Like, a lot, what, he sh what he showed us there, one coach could manage because the main thing is that those kids will be having fun. There's very little instruction. When the whistle goes, make sure you're playing against you know, another player in three minutes' time, and they're going to have fun, they're going to develop, and I think that's, you know, the simplicity of it is definitely the main thing I took from it. Okay, Neil, yourself, Paul mentioned simplicity. What did you take out of it? I thought, really, the, the main thing that you take away from it was about building relationships. It's so key, and we, we understand that, I think, from our own changing room environments and our own clubs, and we nothing else will happen until, until that's right. And... You know, I think those can be the hard conversations kind of to have because everybody has that wee bit of, say, you maybe you don't want to release all your feelings or all your thoughts to, to other people maybe that you don't know particularly well. But whenever you do open up a wee bit and people start to, you know, feel a bit of a bond with you, uh, then that opens them up too. And, you know, we live in a very guarded society nowadays. You know, people are very scared to even be outwardly passionate about their club, their sport or whatever they're into. And, you know, as Chris was saying earlier, like, if you can get people to come out of their shell a wee bit, build those relationships with them, you know, uh, you know, sky's the limit. Okay. Kevin, I'm going to swing down to you and I'm going to put you on the spot immediately. You've been in so many dressing rooms over the years. I know your expertise is obviously in the medical area and it's the, the committee you're on in Crow Park currently. But from what you've seen over the years, what, in your opinion, makes a good coach? Yes, and t thanks, Damien. Um, I would answer that by answering the first question as well. I took a very simple message from that. Every player is first and foremost a human being with their own individual struggles in life. And every player has, as our Belgian friend said, almost tattooed on their forehead, a question, does my coach value me? And having worked with coaches at club, county, and international level, the, the coaches that valued players from 1 to 38, if if player number 38 was meant or was made to feel as valued and as valuable as the Michael Murphys of this world, then that's a successful coach. I was often that number 38. Uh, I never felt valued, unfortunately, so <laughs> I'm about 20 years too old. I'd say if I was there now, I'd be, I'd be really happy with things. Um, Derek, just want to come to you. A, a kind of a stat came out this week that 63 inter-county players had walked away. I would say it's three times that, and I'd say that's based on the ESRI report. And I'd say it's no different than it has been for the last few years. Are we latching onto that now because maybe it's gone so cutthroat at the top and that maybe we're kind of seeing things that we want to see? And I suppose another little side of that question is, 
what sort of a state are we in? Are you happy with the, with the culture that we have? I know we're trying to build up towards it. Are you happy with where we're at? Yeah, well, I just answer the first, well, not answer, but suggest reasons for the first one in terms of, and I got a lot of criticism for suggesting this, even last year, that um, I think, like, like Philip, Philip Manny, for instance, is teaching with us now. He's in on a maternity leave with us. Um, uh, Philip um, retired during the week last week. Um, brilliant young man, uh, great fella. Um, and there's no, there's no other story other than, that, other than you know, he, he just has given it all. And I, what I think is happening is I think fellas are planning a bit more than, it's a, probably a product of, of just planning. You know, the fellas are basically saying, um, I'll, I'll commit for so many years and then my intention is to travel, my intention is to put this amount of time into work, my intention is to put this amount of time into college and then I'll travel and, and I'll put 10 years into the county. Whereas, and I don't think it's a, a reflection on or oh, the county means nothing to them anymore, or, or, you know, I actually just feel that they just, they have a plan now, and no different than the plan that's been developed over 20 years in Belgium, where they actually kind of are sitting down and say, I'm going to commit to A, B, or C for the next 10, 15 years. So, I know the ERSI presented the facts that it's 31 hours, and it's huge commitment, and there's, you know, and I think the by, the by product of the calendar year has to be mentioned when it comes to any discussion around around, you know, players opting out. If there was a sense of certainty, like I managed De La Salle in 2012 and 13, um, and despite what people would say in, 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 in circles that I would hear, we say, we don't know when we're playing, and the fields are empty during the summer, I actually found it hard to get the boys into the field during the summer, you know, because I, I, I felt they wanted to be kind of traveling, and they wanted to be, so I think if there was clarity and certainty in terms of when they start their season, you know, the club players. So yeah. if the club player was coming back in March, as opposed to having, like De La Salle came back last year, they trained on the 2nd or 3rd of January. They played in April. I know I'm getting into a different debate now. They played in April, and they didn't play again then till, till August, till Waterford were out of the championship, if you like. Whereas I, I think if the April was scrapped and they were just playing, they knew they were starting in August, they could come back in the middle of March, and there was a down period for December and January, then that two months could become the time where a guy says to himself, well, I'm heading to Australia for a month, or I'm heading to A, B, or C, and I, I can fit it in. So I think, to answer your original question, why players are opting out, I think it's a combination of just lack of certainty in the calendar, and I think it's, they're planning that bit more. I don't think it's as, that they're not enjoying it as much as people perhaps are espousing. And where we are, I think, I think we're in the process again of fixing that. You know, you know, there was a lot of debate last week about the Boris Salilas and the Schlott Neil boys having to play over Christmas, etc. I think next year that's been forwarded mm -hmm. to, you know, and I think we will be at a period where the finals of the Club All Ireland might be on the 18th of December up here in Croke Park. The boys will have their Christmas, the colleges will have January only, and the inter county player might return at the end of January after having a kind of prolonged off season. So I think that's where everyone wants to get, and the club player will, be, will, will feel happier that he's a certainty in terms of a season. So I think we're getting better at it, you know? Paul, I went down to, um, to watch you guys play Kildare in the, was it, what's the Burn Cup last Saturday. Um, the game was maybe I'm seven. Sorry, sorry for your troubles. <laughs> <laughs> Coming from you, that's grand. I couldn't say that. But you're fecking dead had, right. Had I known, I would have told you to stay away. <laughs> but you're fecking dead right. The game was about seven minutes old when Brendan Murphy walked by me in his guard uniform. And about five minutes after that, he was doing a warm-up. And about seven minutes after that, he was on the field playing midfield, tracking back a Kildare player. How important is it for a coach to realise that people have lives, mortgages, families, jobs, not to burst their balls, to give them some slack? And um, I suppose have a coach that, that understands there's a life outside the GA. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's first and foremost, it's, it's very important. Um, and... My, me personally, I never realized the importance of it until I needed that slack or I need the time off. Um, I was probably one of these guys, I'm um, a, probably a bit of an addictive personality. So when, you know, when I get into something, I, I really get into it. And um, if I, I can't understand, or I, I suppose I'm, I'm 33 years of age now, so I find it much easier to understand. But when I was younger, I might look at why isn't such and such training or why isn't. And it's, it's a bit like what Chris said earlier, touching that, you know, to, to walk 
to walk in someone else's shoes and see it through their eyes. Um, and it's only, like I'm looking at like my job, um, I'm a secondary teacher, and it, it's particularly, it's suited to, to, to playing inter-county football. Um, but not everyone's job is, like take Brendan for example, or take lads, like we've probably somewhere between 10 to 15 lads working in Dublin. Um, and they're young, like they're, they're in their mid to late 20s, they're trying to progress in their job, but yet they're asked to come to Carlo three, four times a week uh, for training. And I think that balance is huge. And to go back to, to, to what you were asking me originally, I think like Turlock O'Brien in, in Carlo has has brought that um, that relationship side that we never had before. Like since when I was 18 until I was 27 or 26 when, when Turlo came in, he was the first Carlo man that managed me in Carlo. Um, he knew not like Turlo knows my, my grandparents better than I knew them. Um, he knows everybody. And he knows, he understands, you know, your woes as well as he, he kind of knows how to get you going as well. And I suppose that's a, that's a relationships thing. Um, only recently, um, you know, I, I, was, I was going for something and work myself and I needed a couple of weeks off. And I actually missed the, the Wicklow game because of it. But he was, you know, to miss a game, a competitive game, I, I've never met anyone as, as understanding as Tarlock to say, well, look, you, you do what you need to do. But when we have you, we really need to have you. Will you go the extra mile for him on the pitch then? Well, that's it. You kind of know that, like, you don't push that. I know now, uh, like, like, say today, I said to Turlock, uh, we were training this morning. I said, look, there's this thing I really want to do. I really want to come up. I'm passionate about coaching. I really want to come up and do this. And um, he's, like, he never has a problem. He kind of looked at you and said, well, look, when, when, we, when we have you, we really want to have you. And that's, that's kind of the way it is. And when you outline to him a month in advance, look, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be there. Um, I just think it's, it is so important. And it's, it makes me feel, anyway, and I'm sure every other player is the same, it makes me feel valued. It makes me feel like I can put myself first, and then, yes, you do go the extra mile when it counts, yeah. Neil, from your county, um, hurling f fanatics, really, um, but then trying to battle against the odds when you, when you do represent your county and trying to get up to tears and stay up to tears. You took a year out then, uh, you know, go travelling and stuff like that. Did you, for somebody who's obsessed with hurling like you were, did you think long and hard about it before you, you left and what sort of response did you get when you, you dropped it into management? Uh, for Antrim, the response wasn't great. You know, obviously we're, we're picking from a small enough pool, so the manager at the time, you know, did try and talk me out of it, whatever, but in 2015, it was 2016 that we that I travelled and our club, Cushendall, had, yeah. had just got to the club final here, so it seemed like a, a natural time to get away and make the break, but I don't think players necessarily say right I'm going to pick between doing traveling or, or, or playing for my county you know that's that's not a, a choice that they make they decide okay I want to travel at some stage and we're, we're a victim of how the world has evolved in that sense travel's easier now you know air travel is cheaper and it's it's more available people can see it you know 50 or 60 years ago it was a massive deal if somebody you know went to America or Australia you know it's a big big journey and those things can be done with much more ease now and, and probably more cost effectively as well. So young people see that, it's nearly cool to go and see different places and you know, social media is probably an influence in that as well. But I think, you know, for myself, I wanted to do it. I was always coming back to play for Antrim, as I did, obviously. And it, was, it wasn't a choice between it. I just wanted to fit that in at, at, a, at a stage in my life and that was whenever I decided to do it. Okay. Kevin, just with your own experiences then, um, when players do go into a squad and they're, they're worshipped and by the supporters, but they're valued by their, their peers and their management. They feel very, very uh, delighted over that, and it's a buzz going to training, but, but they have their own issues as well. What are the, the main issues that young players have these days, and would that have changed over the years from your own experience? Yes, it changes with society. I think if you take a cohort of, say, 38, 40 players, they will reflect exactly what's going on in society. And as Pat Daly said this morning, they will be... Uh, prone to the same negative influences, that is alcohol use or abuse, social media, and um, even uh, using recreational drugs, all, mm -hmm. all of these things. So uh, these are very much a, a problem now. On the positive side is there's the security, if I could use that word, that been part of a squad where you're looked after by a medical team and where you're valued by your peers by, by, and by management. And how would, for any young coach that's here today, um, would you encourage them, Kevin, just to look beyond the games and maybe try and take an interest in a player's personal life as well? Oh, oh absolutely. I, I think you're in a hiding to nothing. If you, if you don't do that, if you don't understand each of your players and a player who you mightn't think would be very valuable to you this year may come good next year, the year after, or, or it will come good in different ways and be different supports within, within the squad. 
just just even you know we we see Kilku who are out there getting ready for their mm. All Ireland final and Mickey Morns you know walking the pitch with them and I know what you know I've met one of their players before and he talks about you know Mickey Morn being the grandfather that he never had you know he's only there eight months you know like but he's obviously he, he's touched those boys there's obviously serious empathy and Derek mentioned Philip Mahoney who retired last week you know he talks you know, childishly about a trip up to Cushendall that Derek took the moment whenever mm. they were they were hurling for Dallas Isle School, and you, you, you could it's so easy to tell that Derek had that rapport with him and, and probably many other of those lads, and there's there's no doubt that that just works hugely in your favour. Just just something that that Kevin touched on there, like um, just the pressures of social media. Um, we we had a, a talk in um, a talk in our school recently about and. The, the man that came in to speak, he, he was speaking about, you know, back in the, I'm not sure what year it was, but we'll say the 1920s and, and smoking was advertised as, as being healthy for you and it's being pushed and, you know, if you were stressed, go have a fag, like, <laughs> told, you know, and, and, like, kids nowadays are all encouraged to be as connected as possible and, and when they're given a phone, I'm not sure what age a kid gets a phone at, but say they're 10 years of age, they get a phone. They're on all these social media platforms and it's almost like... They're involved in an experiment now that we won't know the results of till maybe 20, 30 years' time. The stresses that are put on them, some of them, um, you know, if you're, you're kind of a, a person who looks at yourself and really considers, like, there's nobody, I don't think, in this room who doesn't care about what somebody thinks of them. And, you know, these likes and these comments and things, um, especially behind uh, a keyboard where, you know, people don't even know who's making the comment. Take Twitter, for example. You could have a handle. Nobody knows who's behind it. Um, you know, we, we just don't know the effect that this is going to have long-term on them. Um, it's not that I have a solution by saying this, but I just thought it was interesting that Kevin mentioned social media. Um, you know, you would hope it doesn't have a negative effect in 20, 30 years, that we don't need, have to put constraints on it, but it, it could be a worry. Yeah, because, Kevin, you're being bullied in your own home, where it used to be a safe place, and that's an awful pressure to bring back with you. I, I see players immediately, they come into the dressing room after a match, and this is from minor up to senior level, and the first thing they do is they look at their phones, and they're looking at what people have been saying about them, and oh. it's the same on the bus, and you can see a fella's face, you can read a fella's face, you can know what's been said about them on social media by looking at their face. How would you blot that out, Derek? Yeah, very hard. I, I, you know, I personalise it, I suppose, in terms of anecdotally. I remember being my first year at Watford in 2014. We played Clare, who were All-Ireland champions at the time in Ennis. We were beaten by 26 points. Down in Ennis, we were playing Kilkenny the week after in Nolan Park, beaten by 20 points. And my son, uh, Fionn, and, and wife were at that game. They left with about 10 or 15 minutes to go. Such was the vitriolic kind of, you know, elements of what was being said about our, the team and myself, etc. And, you know, I think there was, a, even going back to 2014, there was a, there was a sense amongst people, ah, you have to harden up, you know, that, that's part of the territory. That's, yeah. that scrutiny is part of it. But I think... The more that, you know, I know Davey highlighted a lot of it last year, and the more people highlight the fact that this is a complete, like, absolute, you know, you know, a breach of privacy, a breach of any type of standards of behaviour when people are allowed openly to say things that are completely untrue, inaccurate, com very, very hurtful. You know, m my son, for instance, didn't go to a match after that. He, you know, he didn't go to the All-Ireland final, he didn't go to the Munster finals, league final, just didn't matter. And it's easy to say... Ah, he should toughen up and he'll get on with it, etc. That he just lost interest based on, 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 on kind of comments, you know, that, that were made. And I think that people need to be kind of aware of, of things like that when they're at games, you know. And I think people are getting better at that. Mm. The highlighting of that in GA circles at county board levels, and I'm talking about official them as well within county boards, who have been subjected to, you know, vitriolic, you know, commentary. And then you're trying to also get the balance right between toughening up your kids as well. You know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, I, I do, think yeah. it's a constant battle yeah. for us as parents where you kind of want them to, to kind of to man up. Like, you know, I, I'm married to, 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 to John Milan's sister and we were saying, I oh, will send him with John and no one will send him to the match when he's with John at the matches. You know, we'll say, you know, we'll send him to the matches with John and anyone says that, John will kind of call him out. So that was kind of part of our process where we'd say, you know, we'd say, we'll, we'll send him with Milan to the games now and, you know, if anyone says that, that Milan will be on, on task there to give him the, the evil eye or whatever, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, you know, but I think, I think we're getting better at it. But again, I'll point out that you still want to get to a stage where, I'm not saying, you know, we, we're all rare tough, I think, at home over the years where you kind of say, look, that's part and parcel of it, Derek, you'll have to accept that, you know, that kind of approach. So you don't want to kind of, it's a fine balancing act between being too, 
Molly coddling as well. You know, I think that's a You bad, want to give him a shoulder, part. but not no, flatten you know, him. I think, is it, that'd be fair. No. <laughs> You're a teacher, Paul. You see it on both classroom and on, on field. And is social media um, a, an issue that... Well, it's an issue for everybody, but the GA is trying to deal with it, in fairness. Uh, how can you deal with it, though? It's a, it's a difficult question. Mm. Um, I know, like, from a school point of view, there's been, there's been cases, uh, our school's not unique in that regard, like, where you have, um, you, know, you have apps that you can anonymously post on. You know, the, what I say, so we'll say I say, Neil is an agent, like, right? And I put that up, and people know who I'm talking about because it's done on location, and, and that gets 60 likes. Neil reads that, he knows it's about him. And mm -hmm. what's terrible about it is the anonymity, it, you know, it's, and it's not until something serious happens, um, which has happened before, like it's not until something serious happens that you have to maybe, you know, get authorities involved and get to the bottom of it. And I suppose, do we need to look at the, the creators of these apps? Do we need to look at, uh, you know, how we monitor what can actually be downloaded? As opposed to, you know, it's nearly, it's bolting the door after the horse is gone when we're looking to put maybe parental controls on something uh, or uh, controls in a school environment on something that, you know, kids are they're far more clever than I am. They, they find ways around this very quickly. You know, they're, they're able to use different VPN platforms and block things and use them. I don't know the, 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 yeah. the short is, I don't know the, the solution, but it, it certainly is a danger and it's something we need to be wary of. And I think, like, the, 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 you know, the, the tough love, when I... In order to, when I grew up, it was certainly what worked for me, like, you know, to be told to toughen up, because then I, I felt, oh, I need to be more manly or whatever, but I don't think, you know, in a good way, I don't think the world is like that anymore, and I think that, like, if we can see it through the students' eyes or see it through the players' eyes, um, you know, sometimes we need to see how they look at themselves, because that allows, them, allows us to deal with what they're going through. Because you would have grown up in Antrim hurling, and that's not a place for the faint-hearted. Uh, you'd have the hands taken off you in a second. You had to work hard at your game to get to the position that you, you commanded. Um, was, it, was it a kind of a... Did you have to be so resilient to work your way up despite your talent? But I know how hard you worked on top of that. I think, you know, nobody really gets to play in our county hurling or football without a huge amount of hard work. Really, That's, that's the long and the short of it. But I wasn't anywhere near the most talented player at my age group uh, in, my, in my club yeah. or in the county, you know, and like my manager from last year, Kieran Kearney, sitting there and he would tell you, like, we, Shane McNaughton and mm. people like that there just, just, just had it, you know, like, now, now he's an actor, I'm not sure if he has that or not, but he, uh, he, he <laughs> has the hurling anyway, but the, uh, the, I, I was a, a maid hurler, you know, really, you know, somebody who just worked and worked until it, it happened and, like, things have changed massively in that regard, like, my father would have been fair, is fairly forward thinking, I would say. But, you know, you don't get told, geez, you were brilliant today, son. I've actually never heard that. Yeah. So, you know, like, but you would get, no, that was good, you know, right. that type of thing. But I think there's, there's a balance to be had there because whenever I was 15, say, trying to break onto my club senior team, you know, I was doing everything I could do to prove that it was a man, even though I know now that it wasn't. You know, but nowadays it seems like we're still treating children, or we're still treating young hurlers and footballers as kids when they're 22 and 23 years of age, there does come a time when you have to say, okay, this is what we expect of you. And it, it's said differently nowadays, but that conversation, I believe, is still very prevalent and has to be had. I want to veer from player welfare just to the medical side, just for two or three minutes of the conversation, Kevin. I'm sure one of the buzzwords in the GA medical sphere these days is concussion and our attitudes to it. Your thoughts on what's coming up on top of your desk as in, you know, on the ground? Um, I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to so many people uh, that are here because everybody in this room has a very, very valuable role to play in implementing the GEA concussion guidelines. The GEA concussion guidelines, you can download them very easily, you can read them very easily, but they all boil down to one sentence, that if you have any doubts about the welfare of a player, then you take that player off immediately. And the reason that you're all so important is that at only about 5% of our games do we have a medic or somebody with the appropriate qualifications. So in 95% of occasions, somebody else will have to make that decision to take the player off. So everybody has to take ownership of this. As we know from players, and probably Paul and Neil will probably tell you this, they're the most unreliable people. I can certainly tell you that from my experience and from international studies. <laughs> so it may be a parent, teacher, manager, selector, I believe myself personally that referees should have a much greater role because often they're the calmest person there. Um, so it, I would say to you that it's, it's vitally important that you educate yourself with regard to concussion and if you have any 
concerns whatsoever, you take the player off. We're, we're going to see a short video. Um, Ryan McHugh, who's a Donegal All-Star, needs no introduction, has talked about his experience of concussion. And in that, you might you will get perhaps an insight into the, the way concussion can occur, how difficult it can be to diagnose it. The initial, it will give you some take-home messages on an initial management and on rehabilitation and on return to play. Okay, roll it there, Sander. My first concussion was a wee bit different, I suppose, to what I knew about concussion because I didn't actually get the, the symptoms straight away. About a week, a week and a half later in training, I just felt a bit dizzy. My doctor, Kevin, was, was fitted, you know, he knew that I wasn't myself that night and that's why he pulled me straight out. The symptoms of concussion that, that I experienced was uh, headaches, a bit of uh, blurry vision, a wee bit of nausea, not, not too much, with the second one was that wee memory loss as well. With the second one then, I actually, through medical advice, was uh, advised just to take a complete rest. In total, I would say I've to, I took off about four or five months. I tried my best uh, to stay away from phones, laptops, television, because that was affecting me, me brain a wee bit, you know. To play for my county and to play for my club is, is, is unbelievable, and it's something that I cherish every day of the week. We were reigning club champions in Donegal and to not be fit to try and go out and retain your title was hugely disappointing but I had to take on board the medical advice that I received and I had to sit out. most difficult part is sitting on the sideline and, and, and sometimes you feel like you're letting your teammates and, and your best friends down when you're not playing but you have to listen to your doctors and your physios and, and take on board the medical advice that you're, that you're being given and, and sometimes sitting out is the best option for you. Thankfully then when I got back training with Donegal I, I put everything behind me and, and winning the Ulster Champions this year definitely was a silver lining to a wee bit of a difficulty. With my experience I've, I've learnt that, that there is so many different types of concussions and, and you can receive blows, you know, it doesn't have to be a direct blow to the head that to have a concussion. I wouldn't have been educated on it until I received my bangs, but I think we all need to be educated before we receive injuries. Try to become more educated on concussion, read up on it, and if you do receive any bangs to the body at all or, or, or to the head, or if you feel that you have concussion, is just uh, pull yourself out of the training session or the game and, and then get yourself checked out. So um, that's Ryan McHugh there, if in doubt, sit it out and you click on the, the link below to, to view GEA concussion guidelines. Just, we've about six minutes left here in our chat and I want to touch on something there, Neil. Um, he set out a hugely important campaign for his club. He's a hugely important player. That takes, that takes guts on behalf of everybody, doesn't it? Pressure he would have been feeling from his local community, you know, to set out the club championship would have been unbelievable. You know, I know in my own, like, I, I, if that was a cushioned all, you know, the pressure inside my own household. Your father be on you. Oh, Jesus, I tell you, you know, <laughs> like, you'd, you'd have to go to Glenravel to buy the papers. He'd tell you he loves you and everything. Yeah, <laughs> you know, he'd tell you anything to get you in the field. But, no, that it shows huge uh, courage of his convictions, and I suppose he was very well supported by Kevin, I don't doubt, and he was probably under a bit of pressure from Kevin to set it out as well, you know, so yeah. I think Ryan's obviously a leader within that group and whenever he spoke and said this is what the problem is and I have to set it out and I don't have an option here, I would say his players probably backed him 100% but you can be guaranteed that people around Kilcar were saying, you know, Ryan McHugh, he only cares about the county, he's forgot about us and, you know, he would have had to deal with some, some amount of stuff. Yeah, yeah, we're going to touch on a few other things. We'll say we have five minutes left. Paul, I want to talk to you. Derek will be glad to know I'm not putting this question to him. I want to mention the word systems. And <laughs> Derek was brave enough to stand alone with his formation and we'll say a counter-attacking game, Derek. Um, but Paul, I want to talk to you. You had to wait maybe two years with injury to get a proper crack at it, maybe when Turlock was, was manager. But then you, you came good, you came strong. 
What were the lessons you learned in that period where you were frustrated at not having a game time? And then you come into a team with heavily systemed there, heavily systemized, but you score very freely as well. So can you talk me through the, the variables in that? Um, well, yeah, the, the first question, injury-wise, I suppose, I, I've been, um, I've had my fair share, I've been on look. Mm. Um, and I suppose I was itching to get going because I was looking at the coaching structures that were put in place. It looked like something, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the kind of a statistical or analyst side of it. You know, you can't give me enough of it, whereas I know some lads don't enjoy it. And each to their own, I kind of, I couldn't wait to get involved. Um, I, I, to this day, I remember we played our first game. I, I kicked a couple of points, maybe one or two points, but I made a comment in a local newspaper that the system takes a while to get used to. And I still have texts off Stephen Poacher maybe once a month. Uh, he'd send me on this headline, you know, as if to say, F you, like, you know what I mean? As if this is me throwing him to the wolves. But, uh, <laughs> like, it did. It took, it took a while to get used to. But I think um, from where we came from, um, mm. you know, we were, we were in disarray. It's when you mentioned the 60 players leaving, like, mm. we had probably 10 players a year leaving. Yeah. Now, the same lads will be coming back because we don't have that many but not sticking around yeah year not year. sticking around and like it was the first like i look at the we have a core group uh, all lads kind of pushing closer past 30 now that like turlo has kept together steven has kept together and we've uh, a new coach now uh, yeah. Stephen o'mara like he's still building on what's been done before and that's more huge for us yeah. yeah like the, playing in a system it is all about balance um and i think neil mentioned it earlier it's about like it's just about i suppose the, the, sorry, Chris mentioned earlier, like it's, it's about when you get to a senior level, the team is important and winning is important, but uh, like on an individual level before that, you need to implement, you need to put people in the system where it suits them. The and I think they'll, they'll enjoy it. The reason I brought it up is we hear, we hear today about having patience and, and having time to expand. The reality for you guys is you might be under pressure to deliver a championship and you might feel the need to, to go with a system, but you made a point to me, Neil, that once everybody buys into it and can see the value, it's a beautiful thing. Derek obviously implemented a system and he just explained to us how difficult the start was, but whenever he had got his system in place, the players bought into it totally, and, you know, with everyone and with a whole heart, and that's a sweet spot. And whenever you have everybody in that same wavelength and that same mm. kind of vision together, like that, 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 that can be a very, very powerful thing. And on the back of that, the players loved it. The players absolutely loved having that clarity of vision, and they bought into Derek, and they, you know, they, they speak so fondly of Derek because of that now. Uh, Neil Ock, uh, no made a one focus. So Derek, I'm going to come to you with a final question. Uh, since you stepped away from Waterford, you've had huge interest like in terms of content for written articles, maybe other counties coming looking for you, but go back to the club. What makes a culture of a club strong, Derek? De La Salle is where you come from, you teach there. Uh, people, I suppose, uh, very simply, the, 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 the authenticity of the people involved. You know, we're, 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 we're not a rural club, so... We have two primary schools, our feeder schools, which are five miles away from each other. One St. Eklund's, you know, alongside the De La Salle College where I teach, and one Stephen Street in the heart of the city. So we have no, we have an area in Grace Stewart that we've developed over the years, but the most of our catchment area are scattered all over Water Waterford City. So hard work, people, connection, and having to constantly work at ensuring that everybody feels included. And that's what we do continuously. Okay. On Kesh Turnock then, Kevin, to you. Again, I'm going to put you on the spot. The team of this conference is culture, behaviour and values. You've seen an awful lot at close-up level. It's an excellent association. What are our values and what could we do a little bit better? <laughs> How long have you got? Um, I suppose our, our values are the value of the individual, their uh, family, community and the value of participation and inclusion. What could we do better? I think the calendar, we've mentioned yeah. that already. Um, already tomorrow, Donegal can't feel a team because of, uh, for very good reason, I can guarantee you they're not hiding behind a smoke screen of player welfare. I can go into details if you want, but um, yeah. I, I think value the individual. So just on, on values, that's why we're here. I was walking across from the Crook Park Hotel this morning. There's a massive billboard outside the building and it says the GA, where we all belong. And just to use this platform, I think that the next time the GA are doing a deal with Sky Sports, RTE, whoever it is, to cover our games, they must do that so as all the Gales anywhere located anywhere on this island are able to play, are able to view our games, because we, in the, in the six counties, we can't avail of the RTE player to catch up on games. Sometimes we, we switch on RTE to watch a big monster championship game, and it says, this is not available in your region. 
you know, like, as a Glens of Antrim, not a GA region, I would argue with that one. But, you know, the, the, I think that's a massive one, you know, for inclusiveness and, you know, the GA where we all belong. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the thoughts of Neil McManus from Antrim. Uh, fellow Sky Sports Ambassador Carlos Paul Broderick, you'll see him in action later on this year. Best of luck, Paul. <clears throat> Uh, hopefully it won't be long before we see Derek McGrath back in action, but until so, you can see him on the Sunday game or there. She's having a Derek McGrath, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> and finally, uh, the great doctor, Kevin Moran from Donegal. Uh, thanks very much, gentlemen. Thanks for your time and insights over the last 40 minutes.